Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, on page 1055 of the Church Bibles. 1055. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Uh, if this is your first time, you won't uh, perhaps have realised that we're taking time just over uh, the last month and the next month to take some time to go through the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, which Jesus gave to us in Matthew's uh, Gospel. But if you have been here more regularly, I wonder how you're finding it. Uh, Andrew kind of alluded before, didn't he, when he said, oh, it, it's a little bit challenging. It can sometimes get at us a, a little bit. It's a, sometimes a difficult listen. Uh, needs some reflection, maybe. Uh, some searching questions, I think, have come up for our own hearts, hasn't it? And I, I'm sure for, for many of us here, uh, you will have found the last month uh, a little bit like that. However, others may be pleased that we're taking time to look through the Sermon on the Mount because, well, there are too many folk who don't pray in a manner worthy of church. Or, you know, a few folk who, who really need to be challenged over their wealth and their possessions. Or perhaps you really hope some others were very listening very carefully when we were talking about worrying last week. Maybe I push a little far, but I do wonder how many times in the last few weeks you've thought, oh, I really hope so-and-so was listening well this morning. Perhaps you've been disappointed because someone else wasn't actually here to listen to the Bible talk. I'll hold my hands up at this point. I am very guilty of this. I catch myself doing it often and I often have to repent and refocus and think about, well, what should I be taking away from the Bible talk? What do I need the Spirit's help to change so that I can become more Christ-like? I'm sure I'm not the only one here who needs to do that. In fact, I know I'm not. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure Jesus wouldn't have commanded us at the start of Matthew 7 to not judge. Jesus knows our hearts, doesn't he? He knows our fallen state. He knows our sin, our selfish attitudes, and how our condemning nature goes before us. And he takes the time to warn us about it. And that's what we're going to see this morning. I'm going to see, I'm going to see from that little few verses that uh, was read to us before, we're going to see three warnings uh, this morning. We're going to firstly see not to judge. Secondly, we're going to watch out for some planks and three we're going to hold on to what's precious. The three warnings for us uh, this morning as we get stuck in. It'd be great to have Matthew 7 open in front of you. Uh, it's page 1055, if you've not already got it there. And you're going to see that these warnings come straight from text. So here's the first one, as James has put up for us. Do not judge. Uh, I've heard it often that uh, some folks say the Bible's not relevant anymore. But this opening warning here from Matthew 7 verse 1, do not judge, actually an incredibly current idea, isn't it? 
Uh, tolerance is a virtue that British society and culture values highly. You may well hear in our schools or on our TV screens that we shouldn't judge people, for their truth is true. And who are we to tell them that they are wrong? That we should keep our heads down in this individualistic age and, and strive for peace, whatever the cost. So is what Jesus is preaching here the most woke sermon ever? Well, from the context, I'm not sure it is, because when we get to verse 6 in particular, you'll see Jesus becomes what would be deemed very un pc very quickly. So what is Jesus saying when he commands us not to judge others? Well, what I think he's getting at from context is that we shouldn't be people who are seeking to find faults with others, who are on the lookout for opportunities to condemn others. He's warning us against a self-righteous attitude in which we write people off and proclaim some sort of final judgment on others in a kind of hypercritical spirit. I think Jesus is very aware. He's used a lot of do not phrases in this sermon. I know in the hearts of people, there are some of us who will use those commands in order to catch others out and delight in reminding folk of their failings. Uh, I was listening to a talk by American pastor Kevin DeYoung on this passage, just in preparation for this morning. He puts it like this. He said, imagine it's bin day. Okay, ours is a Thursday. Uh, no, it's not, it's a Friday. <laughs> so I don't do it very often. Imagine it's bin day. Uh, imagine your wheelie bin or your sack or whatever you put out is full of this week's rubbish. Yeah, there's the, the poo-filled nappies, the leftover chicken, the remnants of whatever has returned in the kids' lunch boxes. It's disgusting. And your rubbish alone is bad enough, isn't it? But the bin collectors, well, they still come along. They pick it up, they chuck it in the lorry, and they take it away. And he comments that that's a wonderful picture of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He took all our rubbish, all our dirty nappies, the garbage of our lives, and took it away from us. Taking our sin on himself, dealing with it once and for all on the cross. But imagine if on bin day, someone goes out and looks through everyone else's bins and drags out with joy the rubbish in their lives. The young simply says, don't be that person. Don't be that person. It's a disgusting thing to do, isn't it? I mean, your own rubbish is horrible enough. Never mind everyone else's. You don't need to deal with it. Let the bin collector, let Jesus deal with it. But some of us can't help it, can we? We can't help it. Perhaps it's just an unwillingness to trust what another person says, assuming oh, there's a hidden agenda there. Maybe we make a, a snap judgment, one from which you won't change. Perhaps you've jumped to the wrong conclusion too quickly. Or maybe you've been part of that conversation in work behind someone's back which goes, the problem with X is whatever it is. Jesus says that's not the Christian attitude. Rather, he says in verse 1 and 2 this. Let's have a look down at what he says. Do not judge or you will too be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Uh, a judgmental attitude is one many of us to some degree will fall into. So how can we counter it? Well, I think Jesus gives us two things to think about in verse 1 and 2. Firstly, 
we should know that we will be judged by God in the same way that we judge others. Now, this might come as news to some of you that God will judge humans for what they've done here on earth, for good and for bad. With that comes some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there will be justice for the wrong done in our world. I think that's great news. But there is also some bad news because it also means we'll all have to stand terrified before God and give an account. And when we're tempted to jump quickly to condemn someone else's actions, We should first be very aware and confident in the fact that God, with justice, will provide the ultimate final judgment. And if we decide we're going to do the judging rather than him, there'll be eternal consequences for us. But secondly, we should use a measure on others that we'd want to be used on us. Very simply... Treat others as you'd want to be treated. Imagine if you were in a courtroom situation as the defendant. You'd want to be treated innocent, wouldn't you? Until you were proven guilty. We'd want a fair trial. We'd want a harsh jury who were quick to jump to conclusions. And definitely not a, a hypercritical individual going through all the rubbish of our lives. We should display the Christ-like values of fairness, justice, mercy in our attitudes to others. Assuming innocence rather than presuming guilt. We're not to have that hypercritical spirit or automatically judgmental attitude. It's very easy to spot that kind of attitude in our world, isn't it? Our media lies in wait, ready to pounce on politicians' mistakes, ready to to dredge up actions and tweets and comments from decades ago to condemn sports stars and shows an unwilling attitude or any consideration towards uh, repentance or how individuals might change over time. Our tolerant society, as we mentioned before, is very quick to cancel anyone who dares to be different or or disagree with what an individual deems to be true. It's a kind of attitude we're, we're prone to as humans. But as Christians, we're to resist. So what are what are we to do? Well, Jesus obviously gives us some help. But first he warns us of our second thing this morning, and that's to watch out. For plans. So that was the first warning, don't judge. Here's the second warning. Watch out for planks. Uh, this is my favourite piece of graffiti ever. It amuses me every single time. Um, I couldn't find an image of somebody with a plank sticking out of their eye. I thought that might be a bit gory. So uh, he's just nicking that plank is what I've gone for. Uh, but Jesus basically says, before we get to anyone else, before we think about anyone else, we need to watch out for planks. Let's look down, verse 3. Uh, just under the big seven there on column four, page 1055, if those Bibles are uh, shut. And he says this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, oh, let me, um, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's humorous, isn't it? It's ridiculous. I mean, imagine walking into Tesco with a large plank of wood. There would be things being knocked off everywhere. Milk would be spreading all over the floor. Jars smashed. Old people sent flying. And a general scene of destruction. Let alone trying to get close to someone's. Oh, I think there's something just in your eye there. It's ridiculous. It's humorous. But Jesus is making a serious point, isn't he? Examine yourself first before going and pointing out faults in others. 
Uh, I hope you've seen some of the songs we've sung this morning. Andrew encouraged us to, to really read the words. And I hope what you've seen as you read them is our sorry state as people. We are all sinners. The Bible tells us no one is good, not even one. We all have our own rubbish we need to deal with. But thankfully we have Jesus. We can come as sinners to the foot of the cross and get all our rubbish, all our planks of wood out and let them be dealt with. Uh, One of the things I was most struck by in growth group on Thursday evening as we uh, looked at Isaiah 53 was our position of utter helplessness as people, our transgressions, our iniquity, our waywardness leaves us in a terrible place and there's nothing we can do about it. But at that moment, up steps Jesus, the servant, willing to be led like a lamb to the slaughter, willing to take the punishment that was rightly reserved for us, to bring prolonged life and a claim to the spoils of victory to those who are made innocent by his blood. Uh, Robert Murray McShane was a, a Scottish pastor from the 1800s, and he very simply said this, my people's greatest need, I wonder how you'd finish that sentence, my people's greatest need, he finishes it with, is my personal holiness. My people's greatest need is my personal holiness. Now as a pastor, I take that challenge very seriously. Very seriously. How can I stand up here and talk through God's word and it's important for us, If I haven't taken my holiness seriously, if I haven't removed the plank from my own eye, how can I begin to talk about the speck in yours? How seriously do you take holiness? Or rather, are you dismissive of those different to us? Resentful, maybe, over how the Spirit works in other churches. Perhaps you condemn the younger generation for not taking holiness seriously enough? Or do you quickly write off the older for being too staid and uptight? We need to come to Jesus, to the foot of the cross, in repentance, get ourselves sorted, get back on track. We need to be able to see clearly ourselves before we start to think about anyone else, wholly relying on him for our holiness. Now, I don't think what Jesus is saying in these verses is that if someone is evidently doing something foolish, we should just look the other way. But I do think he's saying we need to make sure our hearts are right before we humbly, lovingly, gently go and address someone else's. And actually our third morning this morning gets to kind of what happens if we don't spot specks in others. So our third warning this morning is, is hold on to what's precious. Hold on to what's precious. It seems we're regularly removing splinters from our daughter's feet at the moment. Uh, she's always hated it. And we'd hoped she'd mature a little now, she's a little bit older, but no. All chaos breaks loose as the tweezers of doom come out. And the whole neighbourhood knows when we're trying to remove a splinter. Now why do we go through all of that trouble and pain as parents? Well, it's to remove what is possibly the, the tiniest bit of wood you will ever see. But it's important, isn't it? Because if we leave it in there's a real chance there might be an infection. If there's an infection, that gets really tricky to deal with. And it gets really, really uncomfortable for Lucy if we don't deal with that infection. Now, we see this morning, we're not to have that kind of hypercritical spirit in which we jump on every perceived sin and weakness from someone else. But we need to balance that with the call to be discerning. There are plenty of biblical examples where people have needed to make judgments. Moses in the wilderness had to come up with a whole justice system 
to the Israelites, the prophet Nathan had to go and confront King David about his sin. And Jesus, over the page in verse 15, says, we need to be on the lookout for false prophets, wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. That's going to need some level of discernment and judgment. And in chapter 18 of Matthew, he gives us wisdom on sorting out disagreements between church folk. So this morning we need to hold these truths that, that we don't judge and that we need to deal with our own sin and then we need to deal with the specks of dust in others. To do that we need some level of discernment and discipline and we need to hold the warning of verse 6. Just look at verse 6 with me. Andrew pointed it out earlier for us, it's rather unusual. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is the warning from Jesus that there will be those who give up precious truth, sacred and holy things, for the sake of tolerance and perceived peace. And there will be those who are deliberately looking to destroy the gospel. There are people who will treat gospel truth, what is precious, with contempt. And they will trample and destroy it. And will look to tear you as Jesus' followers to pieces. Now these folk can be outside the church, uh, it's a dangerous exercise to try and engage them and to a certain extent foolish to expect them to change because of one conversation <coughs> on social media or a shouting match in the centre of town. However, and more worryingly I think, are those folk who are on the inside of church, who take hold of the gospel trash it and tear folk apart. Those dogs and pigs cause catastrophe for the church and her gospel. Jesus says we should no longer hold the gospel out to those who treat it with contempt. And we need to be ready to discern and remove those seeking to stamp all over it, especially if they're within the church. Now you may think I'm over-egging this. Uh, surely we'll all notice if someone is trying to deliberately uh, trample the gospel and, and tear people apart in church life. But I think we're all canny enough, wise enough to know that very often these acts are not big, old, brash acts of violence or vandalism. Rather they start as small splinters of sinfulness. That if left it unattended in the name of, of tolerance or seeking to keep the peace will grow into an infection which then becomes very hard to deal with. And you may think, well this is very strong language Nathan that you're using here. But just look at the language Jesus uses in verse 6. These people are dogs and pigs. Uh, dogs in the ancient world are not the daft, fluffy cuddle monsters who lie around on sofas all day that we have now. They're rabid. They're, they're wild animals carrying diseases. And pigs weren't funny, lovable, cute creatures either. They were unclean and only fit to give the scraps of human waste to. That's how Jesus describes those who treat the truth what's precious, holy, sacred, with contempt and with a view to destruction. And the warning for us is that we need to hold on to what's sacred and precious rather than throwing it to the dogs and pigs. We shouldn't, in the name of tolerance, waver from the truth of the gospel. We shouldn't, in the name of peace, give up authority of the Bible. We shouldn't, in the name of change, throw away the historic teaching of the church. 
Rather, sin needs to be dealt with. And the church needs to hold on to what is precious. Sadly, we all know of situations where high-profile individuals have fallen into sin and treated what's precious with contempt and have seen and heard about the, the devastating consequences for the church family and the kingdom of God. We need to be diligent in our discernment in order to protect what's precious in the gospel and in the church. But we're also not to judge. And we need to hold these truths in balance this morning. I'm not standing here saying that every time you think someone has probably done something wrong, to take it upon yourself and sort them out. Or to go looking, to go digging around, hoping to find some dirt, something dirty, and, and then taking delight in catching someone out. If you go digging around in bins, you will find rubbish. But remember, we all have to take the trash out every week. Rather, we need to be discerning. If you're sure there's an outward manifestation of sin and that, that something serious has happened and that, that sin has been unrepented of, then come talk to the elders. Talk to our safeguarding deacon. Let it be dealt with in a proper biblical manner and in line with the, the rule of the law of this land. Because in the same way we have to take splinters out of children's feet, so sin needs to be dealt with in the church. It may be like the tweezers of doom, and it may be painful for a moment, but it's much more healthy to deal with it than leaving it to fester and potentially be devastating. I really hope and I pray that we never get to that situation here at our church, at Carlo Baptist. But I also know that as humans, we are more capable of evil than we can ever imagine, aren't we? <laughs> We're going to see in a couple of weeks' time how wolves will disguise themselves as sheep. So let's, let's hear these warnings now. Let's not throw away what's sacred to dogs and pigs who may trample and destroy Let's hold on to truth. Let's hold on to what's precious, knowing that we can take all our rubbish to Jesus and lay it at the foot of the cross, knowing that he can deal with sin and offer re restoration and healing to all. Uh, we started by asking how the Sermon of the Mount has been for you. Perhaps you've been delighted with us getting real and dealing with some tough issues. Perhaps you've identified a few folk in the church family who really need to hear this. Well, can I encourage you in the light of this morning to, to heed these warnings? Firstly, don't judge. Do not judge. Secondly, watch out for planks. Get them dealt with. Thirdly, hold on to what's precious. Hold on to what's precious. I mentioned we looked at Isaiah 53 in our growth group on Thursday. And I'm going to finish with some words from that passage, which we can use as a confession of our own sin. But yet, some confident assurance that, that Jesus has dealt with sin and provided healing and restoration this morning. And if you've got things to deal with in your own lives this morning... Maybe there are some planks which are very firmly anchored, which need dealing with. Firstly, take the trash out. Take the bin out. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Let Jesus deal with it. Give it to him. And if you need some help or encouragement, come find myself, Andrew, uh, Greg sitting over there as well. Someone you trust, maybe, just to help, knowing that actually we all need to do the same thing as well. Let me pray for us. Isaiah, looking forward to our Saviour, says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, 
stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Father, I pray that that would be our prayer today and every day. That we would wholly trust in Jesus for our personal holiness. Thank you for that amazing, astonishing truth. That he was crushed because of us. The punishment that was meant for us actually brings us peace. And that when we take our, our bins out, when we take our rubbish out, when we, when we try and deal with our planks, our wounds, it's by his wounds that we are healed. Father, help us this morning to be a community, a family who take holiness seriously. We want to be loving and gentle and kind towards others. A family who does not judge or boast or look down upon anyone. A family that loves to hear good news from other places where the gospel is growing and spreading and the Holy Spirit is working mightily. Father, help us to be defined by Christ-likeness, we pray. But Father, also help us to hold on to truth. May we treat your word as something precious, a pearl, a jewel, something not to be thrown away, something to be held on to, because it's our inheritance, it's our joy, it's our treasure. Help us to be discerning, we pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've done on the cross. We thank you, Father, for what you have done for us in giving us your word. We thank you, Spirit, for working in us and changing us to be more like Jesus, giving glory to the Father. In your name we pray. Amen.